Hey everybody, it's Dean and I'm back with the awesome, the amazing Suzanne Lindbergh. Now, hi Suzanne, but before I say hi properly, uh, Suzanne joins us from Uber. She is, um, and she's got an impressive role. I don't know how she does all of this, but she manages it somehow. Global head of social brand strategy, social media co and content, and influencer and creator marketing. So, it sounds like you work a million hours a week, Suzanne, but thank you for coming on to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's great to be with you. So just just to kind of get a vibe of what that job title means, just tell us a little bit about what you do and, and, and what your kind of goals and objectives are in what you do. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a lot of fun. It's a great team of people. Um, I'm so impressed. I've been at Uber for a little over a year. I'm just so impressed by how incredibly smart everyone is, how incredibly hardworking and bright everyone is, and, and a group of people who really want to do uh, really great work. So I run social media at Uber. Um, we are active on a number of channels uh, that everybody I'm sure listening is very familiar with. We are active on Twitter and Instagram. We are active on uh, Facebook in different ways. I can explain a, a little bit of the different areas that we activate on. And then, of course, TikTok and LinkedIn as well. And essentially, the role is to run the social media channels from every perspective. Um, in addition to that, given my background of, of having done influencer marketing, marketing and celebrity marketing, first at Apple, where I actually created the role, and then also doing something kind of similar when I was at Verizon. Um, it worked out beautifully when I came on board to have the influencer celebrity marketing piece come on to my team as well. Um, and it makes a lot of sense because a lot of the activations that we are doing that a lot of companies do with celebrity and with influencers happen to be on social media. So there's just like kind of a really nice symbiosis there, if you will. Um, but the role really is to just make sure that we are having very solid, interesting, compelling conversations on social media, both with current customers as well as potential future customers uh, of the Uber ecosystem, which of course we are transportation and delivery. Um, mm -hmm. We are firing on all cylinders at all times, uh, but it is to run the, the global social handles for the company. So just out of curiosity, that all the social platforms are kind of the same and different. Yes. Yeah. How do you... How do you, uh, you know, Uber, I would imagine big team, lots of resources to be able to pull on to put things together. But how do you specialize or kind of focus on a platform, given that you've got so many? What's yeah. some of the things that you do in terms of making sure that you're not just reposting, if you know what I mean? Because I know a lot of people Absolutely. watching this will be going through, how do we do this? And you guys have got resource. What, what are the, some of the yeah. things you do? Well, one of the, I, I'd like to first say that part of the beauty of social media is by its nature, it's actually intended to be pretty scrappy. And so what my advice would be to younger startups, smaller companies who are looking at different resources and how to utilize them and how to um, deploy them properly across several different channels is that don't beat yourself up. As a matter of fact, celebrate having a scrappy approach. Celebrate doing your video on an iPhone and editing it yourself on Premiere. Celebrate taking photos out in the wild of your brand and your products being used by people on a daily basis and celebrate those and make those into your story. Um, take testimonials from people who are a part of your ecosystem. Do fun man on the street type of, I should say man or woman on the street type of uh, content. I mean, that's what we aim to do at Uber. We, we are very fortunate and that we have the resources that we need. I also am very careful not to have an excess of resources. And what I mean by that is you want everybody on your team to be working hard, 
You want them to be really enjoying their days and being really creative. You want them to feel like, wow, I've got a lot of work to do, but it's really fun and I'm having a great time doing it and I get to produce at high levels, but I also get to make impact every day. Um, you know, I think that that's one of the, the, biggest things that I would say to lean into. And it's interesting. I was reading Brand Watch, you know, a lot of people listening, I'm sure are familiar with Brand Watch and, and um, they put out these trend reports and their first number one trend for 2022 was be scrappy with your content on social. And I was like, oh, we learned that lesson a long time ago um, just because it's more relatable. That type of content is more personal. It's more relatable. It's easier to do quickly. And, you know, social media, you got to be quick. You got to be in the moment. You got to be leaning into trends. You got to be leaning into what's culturally happening in the world to be relevant. Mm -hmm. um, you want to make sure that you're always taking an always on sort of approach. And the only way you really can do that, you, you cannot be sitting around waiting for very, very polished pieces of content, right? <laughs> um, you got to go. And we do a lot of original content with our social media and a lot of, lot of capturing stuff out in the wild. And uh, we do it all on the iPhone. So, and do you, when you're talking about that scrappy scrappiness, you're talking about effectively using what you have. Yeah. Um, and I find a lot of the time when you come up with a really good idea, if you kind of spend too much time thinking about this good idea, mm -hmm. it eventually becomes an impossible idea. Mm -hmm. That's a because, very oh, we good point. This, and we could do this yes. and we could do, and then it becomes this mountain yes. that's almost going to sap so much energy that you'll never do anything after it. Correct. People talk themselves into having to do more, 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 more. And I'm not suggesting by any stretch that we approach anything that we're doing by saying, oh, that's good enough. That, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about you set the bar at being at the content itself being, you know, people refer to thumb stopping, but you set your, the bar at is the content compelling and interesting and will it engage people and will it make them feel closer and emotionally connected to your brand? And if it's mm -hmm. doing that, then that content is good content for your social channels. And it is always very mm -hmm. important. You asked this at the beginning of the question, very, very important to understand the, the nuances of each channel and make sure that you're leaning into and using those nuances and also what each channel is particularly good at, make sure that you're taking advantage of what that channel is particularly good at. So you don't want to just be creating the same type of content and just saying like, we'll just throw that across the channels. It'll be fine. Right. Sometimes you do that. Sometimes you're taking uh, a piece of content and, and you are using it across multiple channels and, and it works well. Like a lot of companies these days make nice and easy Instagram posts by just using, there's a piece of software called Postify. That's what we use where you take mm -hmm. a tweet and you make it into a graphic for Instagram. And that's become kind of a popular kind of easy graphic that, um, that people like. And a lot of brands use, we use it occasionally where we're taking something that, um, as a matter of fact, we just did this on Friday. We took some tweets from customers who had particularly great experiences in their Uber recently, and we post made those into like a postified graphic and posted mm -hmm. that. Um, but you want to be sure, like, make sure that if you're on TikTok, you're making TikToks, you're not making ads, you're using trending sounds, you're being great with your video, you're really using the nuances of TikTok to make TikToks. When you're on Twitter, we tend to find that um, text tweets by far perform the best. A lot of mm -hmm. people put graphics with their tweets. A lot of people put videos with their tweets. We do that too. Sometimes that makes sense for us to do. But text tweets, that's what Twitter was built for, text few sentences, right? A few crisp, crisp sentences um, mm -hmm. works best on Twitter. So make sure you're leading into that on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, Instagram, there's kind of this little, you know, Instagram's trying to become a big video platform. They're kind of, you know, taking a page out of TikTok's book. Um, and we started leaning into video on Instagram. Uh, but we make sure that we, we also, uh, 
you know, balance it out with some static imagery and some other stuff. But, you know, I think that that's an important thing too, is that you, you want to make sure you're utilizing the nuances of each platform. And I also think it's okay for small businesses, choose a platform that works for you and just stick with that one for a while. You don't have to be on every platform. You know, we, uh, I think I said a little bit earlier, um, you know, we do TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Um, we love all that. That's where we are right now. We work very hard across the board on those. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not, we're not adding anything new right now. There's a couple of other things bubbling up out there that we're looking at. Uh, but, uh, nothing that we're adding in the moment. We're also on YouTube. I mean, I, I you know, YouTube, mm -hmm. I think is actually yeah. a channel that's going to grow even more in its importance in general. I think YouTube's a wonderful, wonderful place for, for, mm -hmm. uh, short films and, and some really emotionally connected content too. Yeah. And I think, I think TikTok has made that scrappiness come back. A hundred percent. Like Facebook, there's been this wave of almost professionalization of social media. And yes. there's, you know, there's a certain standard, like you say, that things have to be presented by a brand. But actually, if you weren't a brand, if you were a small business owner or if you were not, you know, a big celebrity that didn't have the resources, it always felt that you were the poor cousin. But now when you see brands doing scrappy content, you know, I saw, um, I don't know if you saw the Ryanair one where they just put a picture oh, of yes. the mouth moving over the top of it. Yes. And it's like, they, they it, get it's pretty made cheeky. it easier than Ryanair ever. gets pretty cheeky. They're, they're, they're having a good time over there. And it, it, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? How certain brands yeah. um, how, uh, have kind of adopted a personality on a platform. Yes. Yes. And it's not like if you go to um, Ryanair, they are a no nonsense, straight talking. Yes. It is what it is kind of brand. But they've taken that into a kind of comedy element. Yes. On that on that platform. Yes. Do you and it see... doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't work for every brand. Right. So so some brands can do that very, very well. One of my favorite ones to follow. I really enjoy them and they can have a lot of fun with it, given the products that they make. But Sour Patch Kids is one of the funniest mm -hmm. Uh, brands on Twitter, certainly. Um, I think McDonald's does a pretty extraordinary job. They do, they have a lot of fun too. They do a nice job. Um, but yeah, I mean, having a voice, we, I feel we have a voice on social media over time since I've been there. We've tried to make that voice just a little bit more playful because again, I keep going back to this thing of emotional connection. That's where I think that brands are changing over time is that, um, your brand. And I learned this really at Apple and Apple was very ahead of its time uh, under Steve Jobs. Certainly a lot of brands think that their brand is the, you know, is, is their product. And it's really not, it's about values and emotions that buying from you or buying your products evokes. It's almost mm -hmm. like the solutions of your products, not the products themselves. So um, a great example of that would be for Uber is, you know, we delight people because we're there when they need us. If it's raining outside and they need to get to where they need to go, you know, they can go to the dentist, to the birthday party, to the fancy dinner out or what have you. We have different products for each of those occasions. We have different price points for each of those occasions. We have everything from you know, bikes and scooters all the way up to charter buses, right? And so when we talk about those different products, we talk about the solution of those products. We talk about mm -hmm. the emotion of those products and the connection for the customer mm -hmm. to those products. Like why why do they use the, that particular you know, car. Why do they use an yeah. Uber X instead of an Uber XL? Or why do they get the Uber, um, the the Uber van instead? You know what I'm saying? So that yeah. that's where I think brands are are really, and we we've been doing a good job of that. Where they're really headed, it's the emotion and the emotional connection and mm -hmm. the way that the products play a role in people's lives. And this was something at Apple that we learned. Steve never would talk about the tech specs of the various products. Certainly yeah. the tech specs, you could find them on the Apple website. And if you had questions when you went into the store, you could ask them 
you know, how fast is this chip or whatever. But all of the marketing was all about the emotion and the relationship mm -hmm. to the product. What does the iPhone give you in your life? What does the iPod give you in your life? What does uh, just was all this emotion and feeling around being an owner of that product, we did not yeah. lead with the chips. What he called them, the chip, you know, the sort of the the, the yeah. chips and 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 speeds and feeds. We never led with that. Well, um, it, so. It's be kind of like Uber now switching their social media to say, "Hey, we've got Mercedes Benz cars." Yeah. Or hey, we we've got we've got this car or that car or the other. Right. No, but don't get upset here. But nobody's buying an Uber be, or, you know, booking an Uber because it's a Mercedes Benz car. It's like exactly as you say, I'm going somewhere. I want the convenience. I want to relax. I don't want to stress about it. I want to know my big bugbear. I don't live in an Uber area. So, oh, um, OK, Interesting. I want to know. I want to know that that cab, that car is actually around the corner. Right. Not what they tell me. It's around the coming around the corner. <laughs> We have some of the longest corners around here. <laughs> it's unreal. It's just but a peace of it, mind. Like, you know, you need to go somewhere. You want the convenience and the, uh, and there is a magical nature to it. I remember when I took my first Uber, I was blown away. It was in San Francisco. It was back in, I think, 20. 11 and San Francisco is notorious. I think it still is to this day. I live in New York now, but San Francisco is just kind of notorious for not being a cab city. New York, you can usually walk down on mm -hmm. most corners and hail a cab and be on your way. Um, but even still then, I love the convenience and the and the accuracy and, and knowing that the Uber is on its way to come get me. But in San Francisco, I'll never forget when I use, someone said, oh, you got to use Uber, download the app. I did it. We were coming from work to go to a dinner, so I needed to be at the dinner at a specific time, right? I didn't have time to hope that I could find a cab or what have you, um, and use the app, and the car pulled up, and it was like, oh, my God, this is magic. This is like magic, right? And it is that magical feeling that that one has about... Um, and, and like you said, you said it a little bit earlier, you sit in the car, it can relax. Okay. I'm going to, I know when I'm going to be there, I can share my ride. I can let the people that I'm meeting know when to expect me. Um, it just is that much more, uh, you know, via the convenience and the accuracy nature of it and the planning nature of it. It's a peace of mind. You know, uh, that that I, I one little thing I don't have to worry about kind of during the day because I know it'll come to me, get me, deliver me to where I need to go. So let me ask you, because you're 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 t doing very much the brand and I, I'm 100 percent with you in in the you know, in the in the business sales context, we'd say you're selling the outcome or selling yes. the benefits, not the feature. Yes, uh, it's very similar. How would you how would you? differentiate or just talk to me a little bit about the differences and similarities between say a, a brand like uber and then like a personal brand where's the overlap and where's the big differences between an individual's brand and um a, a company brand and this is particularly relevant with the likes of um steve jobs he had his own brand and yes. then apple as well just talk to me a little bit about the differences and similarities well, it's so interesting because, you know, Steve, I think Steve would tell you that he did not work at all um, on his personal brand. It was actually something kind of very foreign to him in a way. He never, in, in terms of actively working on like a personal brand. Mm -hmm. But then if you kind of look, there were, you know, he was one of the biggest, most well-known entities, uh, individuals, and still to this day in tech uh, and in, you know, just business and branding and marketing and, and all that, just, you know, very recognizable, well-known um, entity. So one would say it's, it's a brand. I mean, I think that these, it, these things are becoming a little clouded is my opinion, because I think as brands mm -hmm. understand more and more that they need to not have their brand be 
entirely focused on what their products are and what their products do, but rather on their values and what they hope Mm -hmm. to stand for. That's where I feel it starts to really mesh into personal brands, right? Because Mm -hmm. I, 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 I would define a personal brand as, as the things I care about me, the things I care about, the things that I stand for, the things that I will fight for, right? Um, That's kind of my personal brand. That's at least my definition of a personal Mm -hmm. brand. Um, It's sort of what I choose to uh, care a lot about, what I choose to talk about and share of myself. Um, It's what I stand for, the values that I hold near and dear. Um, and I think as corporate brands or, or business brands are recognizing that that's kind of being more demanded, like knowing what a brand stands for and what they care about is being demanded more and more by customers. Um, that's mm-hmm. where these things are starting to converge a little. So I, the differences for me are becoming far, um, far less sort of mm-hmm specific, sort of far less defined. Um, I know for us, a lot of the actions that we take as a company right now, well, actually all year, we've been doing a lot of really important work um, around Ukraine and keeping Ukraine moving and helping as much as we can uh, people in Ukraine uh, to to get the goods and services that they need um, and get them moved around to the places they need to go um, even despite what's going on in the world, in, in their, in their country, mm-hmm. um, it's been very important for us to partner with different entities and, and, and we have this tagline, keep Ukraine moving really, really important to us. That's something that's important that we stand for. We do a lot of social impact work at Uber. It's really, really important work, making sure that we're helping, uh, various communities. Um, you know, it even extends into things like, um, the work that we did around getting people rides to get their COVID vaccines. Right. Um, it extends to something that we're doing right now in collaboration with the white house to get people delivered medications that they need if they have COVID. Um, so, so those are things that we stand for. Those are important things. That's, that's important to our brand. Like we care, we care deeply Mm -hmm. about our customers. We care deeply deeply about what's going on in the world. We care deeply about keeping people moving and getting to the places they need to be and getting access to the things they need to get access to. Um, and so I really do see that this, there's sort of this blending of, of at least my definition of a personal brand and what mm-hmm. we see certainly at Uber as a, as a corporate brand, right? Um, yeah. I mean, one of the things that I always say to people, it's kind of interesting. One of the areas that people sort of uh, talk a little bit about is, um, you know, how to talk to customers. And I always say to people, well, you're one of our customers, aren't you? People who work here, we're all customers of Uber. What do we like? Mm -hmm. What do we care about? Like, Mm -hmm. Don't forget that. Don't forget that we all here are customers of our company. Yes, we work here, but we also view the world from a customer POV and a customer perspective. And we have a lot of opinions as customers of the brand that we happen to work for about things that would make using the brand, using products a little bit easier. So let's not forget that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I I just, uh, people forget that they're customers sometimes when they work for a big company. They're like, oh, that's right. I'm a, yeah. I'm a customer of this brand. I forgot about that for a minute. And I, I guess it's really easy. Or it, it, I see this a lot with lots of businesses, but it's, it's re, it, the inverse can be true too, is that a lot of kind of the brands that existed 20 years ago, if you look at what happened to them, is they basically stopped talking to their customers. Mm. If you know, if you look at you know the famous one, Blockbuster. Yeah, they had the option to buy Netflix and decided yeah. this will never take on. They didn't really yeah. look at the market and go, "What's the market telling us?" They were just listening to themselves. And I guess what you're saying there is, we all exist by the the grace of our customers, mm-hmm. and if we forget what they think and what matters to them. Right we die 
Yes, that's exactly. There, there are a lot of blockbusters, a great example of that. There, there are those handfuls of famed stories about just ignoring, right, where what customers are telling you is important to them or where they're, you know, where customers are headed. And I don't know if it's, I, I obviously, I don't think that it's out of any kind of odd, uh, it may be arrogance. Maybe there's some arrogance in some of those companies that um, disables them from seeing the bigger picture. Maybe it's fear. If we make, you know, it's hard to make big, big changes. It's really hard to make big, big changes, right? And so you get very fearful of, you know, what resources are we going to need to make big changes? What's this going to cost us? What if we fail? What if we make this big change? What if we make this big bet and we fail miserably? There's so much fear wrapped up in those kinds of big decisions. And um, and so maybe that's what they just kind of hope, like the famed ostrich in the, in the head yeah. in the sand. That's really a mechanism that the ostrich uses is that if I don't see the scary thing that it doesn't exist. So maybe if they, you know, companies think if they just ignore the scary thing, it'll go away. Um, mm-hmm. It is, it is funny, but some of those instances too, like it's, it's, I've been around long enough that Blockbuster was a big part of my, uh, of my life early on. And I remember the ritual of going to the video store and picking out the videos mm-hmm. that you wanted. And it was really fun to go do that. Right. Um, yeah. I don't know if at the time anyone could ever imagine that we would just be streaming all this stuff on the TVs that are sitting in our living room right now, right? Um, I thought it was so amusing that I found out recently that do you know that Netflix still does have a series of DVDs that they do send out to people? They still that's they still, still part of their it. business. They still have it. I read. Um, I read uh, the number. It's like just a couple of thousand. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's not a lot. It's like a small warehouse or, or what have you, but they still have that for certain parts of the world. Wow. So, or parts of, I, I don't know if it's just the United States, but yeah, isn't that kind of interesting? I mean, we can't uh, forget uh, too, like, let's not forget there are a lot of people in this country that still don't have broadband. Right. So mm-hmm. the, the convenience yeah. is the fact that I'm talking to you here on a podcast and you and I are doing a video podcast to, to each other is just people, many people just couldn't even make that leap because they're still having a struggle, di- you know, dialing up to, to send emails. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's just kind of interesting why those decisions get made. Mm-hmm. So, so, uh, pivoting a little bit from personal brand, you part of what you do is also talk and work on the kind of influencer, celebrity, mm-hmm. and uh, creator uh, worlds. How have you seen that change over the last couple of years? And there's been a lot of kind of how do you know who really is an influencer and who isn't right. because of the vanity metrics and stuff. Tell me a bit about what you've seen in the world of the creator economy. Yes. Yeah, so it's very interesting. And, and I, I separate creators from influencers and even celebrity. Um, mm-hmm. One tends to use influencers and celebrity when you have a defined message and you want them to take your defined message, maybe even your defined content, um, and you just want them to push it into the world for you, and you're taking mm-hmm. advantage of their reach and their credibility with their audiences. So that's important yeah. as well. You're taking advantage of the fact that they have a lot of credibility with their own audiences and fans, maybe even more credibility than you have in the moment, or more like maybe more authenticity than you have in the moment. So you use them to help push a pretty defined piece of content or a scripted piece of material that you want them to get out to the world from a from a simple reach perspective. And that can be very valuable. We do some of that uh, work and we just make sure that we are using our, our, you know, authentic, the authentic nature of who best to work with on that um, and who will have the most resonance on that. And then creators, and I think more creators of you give them a pretty vague concept and you ask them to really imprint it with their own style, their own creativity, their own um 
sort of purview or POV on the world. And presumably you've done a really, really good job of choosing the right creators up front so that when they deliver the content to you, it's not super off base and and un, and therefore unusable. Um, but we do a lot of our creator work mostly on TikTok. And there's a, a handful of creators that we work with um, helping them to understand some of the things that are important to us right now. But then we really want them to run with it and make sure that yeah. their personality is imbued throughout, that it's really of their um, of their POV. That's really, really important. Mm -hmm. And um, then we will post that content uh, to our TikTok. We'll do that a little bit on Instagram as well. But it, it, that's a nuance. Like that difference is kind of a nuance. Um, mm -hmm. The influencer area, I, I think you're right. Everybody, it feels like everybody's an influencer now, right? And so I think it's really important for brands to make sure that they are um, thinking really, really hard about the types of influencers that that really are authentic to their brand, right? And that um, I think have uh, certainly reach, but certainly can uh, deliver maybe an audience of people that is uh, is really important and critical to moving things forward. Um, celebrity, I find that, cele you know, then you've got this whole bucket of celebrity and they're really, really fun to work with. They have huge, 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 huge reach, right? And we across the company work with mm -hmm. them in many different ways. Obviously, you'll see Uber advertising that has celebrities in the advertising in some instances. Mm -hmm. um, and then there will be social aspects to the stuff that we do with them as well. Uh, we'll post those ads across our social to make sure they get nice, nice social reach as well. Um, but I kind of look at it as three separate buckets. And I, I think that the, the important one for the TikTok is kind of really um, engage this world of creators and the creator uh, grouping that uh, is just much more, uh, I think, a, of a collaboration on the content creation. Um, whereas I look at the influencers as more of a reach equation. So, so I'm going to tread into some sticky waters and feel free to skip past this, but <laughs> how does it feel to have a, a YouTube genre about Uber passengers? Now, feel free to decline this answer because we didn't talk about this, but I subscribe to a channel, right? And it's called Entitled Uber Passengers, right? Yeah, I'm not <laughs> going to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, that's new. I, I haven't seen that. Well, one thing that here's what I will say, I'm not going to talk specifically to that channel. One thing that I will say is that we are hugely focused on making sure that everybody has exactly the type of ride that we all want to have, like pleasant, mm -hmm. Um, you know, gets you from point A to point B. You know, safety is a very big deal for Uber. Uh, convenience, comfort, all of those things are very, very important to us. And we do spend a lot of time. We have a very significant uh, customer care service and support team that does pay attention to making sure that that everybody has a, a positive experience in an Uber and they really do everything that they can to make sure that that's the case. That's about what, what I, I will, will have to say about that's important. Yeah. And that's part I, of our I, value I, set. I, I, I it's a big part of our that, values. Really. Yeah. That's a yeah. huge part of our value set of what but we really is, care about. It is. I mean, coming full circle. And I, I know that's kind of a tricky to topic because you've got drivers and passengers and all sorts of stuff. Right. It is, it is quite interesting what content is interesting sure like i'll yeah. give you an example my 16 year old uh watches people playing video games i'm very familiar with this genre <laughs> <laughs> and it's teenagers like, love to do that understand. that's why pewdiepie has got a huge like that's how pewdiepie started out is i think the biggest mm. on youtube of people watching him play video games it is an interesting genre yeah. Yeah. But I, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because I look at that and go, well, why, why would I, I know, why would I watch that? Yeah. Yeah. This, I think this is where understanding your own audience yes. becomes really important because yeah. that's where you start to realize actually they're, they're interested in a whole other thing. And it's about who it's about where the customers are. 
It's about where your audience is, the people who you serve are, not necessarily where you think. And that's where I think I know a lot of small businesses struggle with this is what's it our what's in our audience's interest? What are they interested in? Yes. Rather than as we talked about earlier, uh, I think before we recorded, TikTok's not just slapping ads onto TikTok. Correct. That's not what it's about. Correct. And you can you can do in fact, I'm going to, I always talk to people about how can you tell people about what you do without telling people what you do? And that's really the content and how you play it out, isn't it? Absolutely. Have you got any examples you can share of how you do that? Tell, telling people about Uber without telling people about Uber. I think that's a TikTok thing, by the way. Yeah, it is a TikTok thing. Well, that is that's kind of what we do is we we find great trending sounds on TikTok and we we create an Uber lifestyle there. That's kind of I think really how you do it. There are all these relatable moments that people have um, who are our customers, right? And we're always trying to look for those very relatable moments and. Um, and uh, lean into them, certainly on TikTok and lean into them with a trend wherever possible. Little things like, you know, when we did a TikTok a while back of finding a, a water in the, like the, the, some of the drivers who put, you know, little distinct water bottles in the back of a car. And that's all about just making sure their customers are comfortable and their customers are um, well taken care of. And so we did a little TikTok about that, just like the <gasps> finding the water in the back of the car. That's very exciting, right? Little things like that. And then mm -hmm. that, that we don't have to say like, we don't have to say, oh, some drivers may put water in the back of the car um, for your convenience. No, that's inherent in, in that moment of oh, exciting. We found water in the back of the car, right? Um, it's that it's that comfort that's conveying that comfort and convenience and being taken care of and having, you know, on your way to wherever you're going, having um you know, a good experience, a magical experience. And that's what we did to, to convey that certainly. And, and we do use the platform, you know, there are other little things that just funny things that people do, um, in and around, like when there are people are obsessed with looking at the app itself, watching their driver, make their way to them. Right. And so we did a little yeah. funny TikTok um, around that, that was humorous and used a trending sound, but also what we're relaying there is like every aspect of this experience is well laid out. You know, when your car is coming, that's magical unto itself, but it also is a peace of mind and it's convenience. And it's knowing it's you being able to be planful around, okay, it's two minutes away. I'm watching it come. Okay, great. You know, just those little things that just, we don't have to kind of beat people over the head, if you will, of the different features and benefits of the app. We just show how the app comes to life in their everyday um, mm -hmm. in their everyday usage of the product and in their everyday lives. Right. And so that's it's what we like very heavily into on TikTok. I bought, I bought this t-shirt from a shop in London and, uh, they, it, it wasn't a cheap t-shirt, but they took it, they folded it up really nice yeah. and they wrapped it in front yep. of me and put the stickers on and everything. And it was just this that moment of feeling really special was yes. just like, this is really nice. Yes. Instead of them just kind of um, grabbing it, throwing it in the bag and handing it to Yeah. No, um, it is those little, guess, those little touches are amazing. Yeah. And, and that's really what people remember, isn't it? It's not, yes. it's not the color of the car. It's uh, maybe if they ask for a conversation in the car, it's the conversation they had with somebody. But even just that little thing about conversation, like it's just, there's just little touches about, I don't know how, I don't live in an Uber area, but outside of when I'm not here, I'm in an Uber. Yeah, absolutely. And we do a lot of, we have this very popular series that we do on our social called Five Star Stories. And what we do is we are just looking for those magical moments that people share about being in an Uber. And um, we they'll either tweet about them or post them to their social media. That's how we find them. And we we ask them if we can use their tweet or their, their post. We get in touch with them. Can we please use this? They always say yes. And then we post that. And um, we posted a, a picture recently of just like during um, uh, 
uh, you know, during the holidays, the, the one Uber driver had a bunch of candy in the back of the car. And the person was talking about like, oh, this was so nice. I got into this car and it was so festive and it was decorated. And, you know, there's a pride of, um, there's a really true pride of, um, of the, the, uh, drivers and and the couriers of doing a good job and wanting to create that magical experience along along with Uber and um you know little things like that really go a long way and people talk about them they talk about those moments and they share them on their social and then we in turn can can share them as well and it just it, it's what the one series that we do that that always does incredibly well in terms of engagement people just love seeing those stories it's nice and we do them from around the world as well so it's nice oh that's awesome so thinking it's, we're going into 2023, uh, mm -hmm. 2022 went really fast. Yes, it did. Um, what, what are you seeing on the horizon social media wise for 2023 that people could pick your brains on today? Wow, that's a great question. Well, video obviously is here to stay, right? So people yeah. have been playing around with video and toying with video in 2022. And some brands have done more of that than others. But video is definitely here to stay, short form video for sure. Um, and I think that that is definitely something that, you know, will continue to do, other brands will continue to do. Um, in terms of social media channels, I don't see huge... Uh, ch dramatic changes right now. Um, it'll be interesting to see where Twitter heads. You know, there's been a lot of changes there. Um, I don't want to get too much into commenting on on that, but let's see where that heads in 2023. But we are always we always have our eyes and ears open. I, I'm curious where Be Real heads. You're familiar with Be Real? Yeah. That's yeah. really interesting. It's very authentic. Authentic to its or I don't know how brands play there yet. I know some are dipping their toes into the water and trying some things out, but I never would want us to get into um, a channel that I didn't feel uh, we could authentically play in. Um, so I think, you know, I think a, a, another area, as I said, YouTube, I, I feel like there's going to be a little YouTube resurgence. I think that YouTube is, it's, it's always been very popular, but I also think that there's going to, because of the focus on video, um, on TikTok and now Instagram reels, I feel like TikTok, I feel like YouTube is going to have, uh, a, a little bit of a, of a more, um, how do I want to say research? I don't know. The resurgence is not the right word because it didn't go anywhere, but just maybe mm -hmm. more of a celebratory, like, Hey, let's do this on YouTube too, or let's lead on YouTube. I just think that that acceptance and embrace of video, um, will help YouTube to, to shine really bright as well. Um, but, uh, what I did read an interesting article too. I, I, I wonder, I, a very fascinating article that said a lot of the streaming services are not ordering as many new shows as they had been, um, wow. in for 2023. And so I think a lot of those writers and creators and directors and actors and, and talent, um, are not going to have as much of an outlet on, uh, streaming services, uh, because those streaming services are having to, I think, cut costs a little bit. Netflix saw its first downtick in subscribers this past year. So I do wonder what are they going to do in the meantime? I think that they're mm -hmm. going to have to take things uh, to places like YouTube and see, you know, because they're not going to stop creating. Creative people don't stop creating. If there's less of an outlet that is scurrying toward paying them and getting them up onto streaming, then maybe something like a YouTube will take advantage and, and, and lean into that even more. I literally just read that article yesterday, I think. So kind of that, interesting. That could where, be where it's really headed. interesting yeah. In, in, yeah. in both ways, couldn't it? I mean, if you had, you know, if the budget wasn't there, you could have almost well-known or well-respected people in the TV movie world actually bringing more access content to YouTube. Yeah. And equally, you could have some of the streaming flat platforms just going, oh, they they've got an awesome channel. Let's turn it into a show. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that there's going to be some looking into um, efficiencies and and it's certainly about I, I think it's, it's about quantity. Certainly, um, you know, there was the sort of uh, feeling in the streaming world of the last couple of years that 
you know, the customers always, and it is kind of true. Customers always, they want something new to watch. They need something new. They need to start a new show. Like that lingo of like, I need a new show. That whole thing is like, I need to start a new show. Um, they're just finding that they they can't have as much they just don't have the budget right now i think to put as much of that into play and try things out as much as they had in the previous past couple of years they're going to have to just i think take take 2023 to take a look at you know what they're producing where are they going um but i think mm-hmm. youtube could benefit from that so that's yeah. why i'm going to be keeping think, my eyes on the real big problem that. with the the big problem with the streaming services is we watched everything in 2020, 2021. There's nothing left to watch. <laughs> well, you're right with people, with people being at home. That is really true. And I also do wonder if some of this too is not an anticipation of people now get, getting out of their houses a little bit, getting out of uh, wanting to go and do things. It's interesting. I've, I've most recently started going to movie theaters again, right? And people mm-hmm. are starting to go to movie theaters again. And you got to imagine that the big studios are happy about that. That stuff is getting big releases in movie theaters this holiday season. Some big films. I think the big film that really proved that out was Top Gun Maverick. And that's a film that was shot uh, and was ready to go. And then pandemic hit and they held it. They said, this movie Mm -hmm. needs to be released in a theater. We're holding on to it. We're not releasing it. Um, on just streaming services. And they look at the box office on that. People came out to see that and some of these bigger films as well. So, um, I, you know, like there was, they're shifting balances in the business, right? Is I think where, I think what's, what's going to happen. Um, yeah. If I, I look at where my kids are, Avatar. like TikTok is it. This is where my, yeah, Avatar is a big one coming. Out. My kids are on TikTok. That's what they're on, TikTok and Instagram. Um, that's what they care about. That's what they're on. That's what their friends are on. They love getting sucked into, as they call it, like I got sucked into a, a rabbit hole of like, you know, kind of, which is kind of what used to happen on YouTube. I think still happens on YouTube for sure. Yeah. But like they use those words and references now for TikTok and Instagram reels. And so uh, it's just kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, and and when you think about it, actually, platforms like TikTok, even YouTube shorts, Instagram reels, they're very much like mini TV series. Yes. yes. Uh, that's what they are, really. They're yes. three minute, one minute, 56 seconds TV series. That's exactly right. And um, Yeah. And I think the people who create actual series do do themselves well instead of just posting. Like that's another thing that we found is there's a familiarity that people like about series. They like to see something, engage with it. And then they like to see like sort of a different, you know, they like to kind of see it again with the new episode. And so there are certain series that we've done on our TikTok, certain series that we've done across our social, that um, that familiarity breeds a warmth and an emotional connection. And people really like that instead of just this hodgepodge of just throwing a bunch of different content against a wall. And And so we have, you know, we have our series that we lean into. Some of them are weekly. Some of them are just, you know, twice a month. Um, And then uh, and then we also lean into trends and culture and what's happening in the moment as well. So it's that nice balance of those things Mm. that I think uh, plays out very nicely. And one final question. Um, And I don't know whether you how you will answer this one, but we can have a go. Given that trends can happen so quickly. Yes. How do you plan for that? So you can't plan for a trend. Very often in the trends I'm talking about, you wake up that morning and we see that something is really starting to hit. And so the way that we build out our calendars is we, um, we, it's kind of twofold. We are as planful as we possibly can be. And there are some very planned things, right? You know, we know that this product, this particular product might launch on this one day. So we put that on the calendar. We know that this one ad campaign may launch on this other day. So that's on the calendar. So we build out as much as possible as we can into our social calendars um, along those lines. Okay. Then... Mm -hmm about usually the last week of the month. So we're doing it this Friday, actually. This Friday, the team will get together for about an hour and a half. And we will pour through the January and a little bit of the February calendars. And we will lay out our calendars as best as we can for the next month. 
and we'll look at things like culture calendars. We'll look at, oh, are there interesting movies that are going to release or TV shows that are releasing? Are there interesting cultural moments that are taking place in the month of January that we want to make sure there might be like an uber way into that cultural moment? And so we'll plot that out as much as we possibly can so that we go into the month with a fairly robust calendar, because then we want to start working on some graphics and some videos and some copy and that kind of thing. But then if we get up one morning, we have a production meeting every single day. If we get up one morning and there is something starting to trend, we will scrap certain plans and very quickly, my graphics guy, my video guy, my editor, and my copy, we will all very quickly, usually talking about it in the production meeting, but then we might take it to Slack or something like that. Um, we will figure out how we're going to lean into that trend and get it posted so that we're in the moment and we're into that trend. Um, so it's it's kind of like, you, it's just like, it, it's sort of like plan, 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 then what? We got to jump into this, right? So it's, it's, it's just, it's, not everybody can kind of wrap their brains around having to kind of have that very kind of two sides perspective of the world, mm -hmm. but you have to in social, you just have to. And so that's enabled us to uh, be on top of some trends that we see bubbling up. We use different tools to identify trends. Um, we also rely heavily on our community management folks to see what things are bubbling up. They might reach out to me and say, hey, we're starting to notice that there's this trend happening on Twitter right now. We think there's a way in for us. Um, we're going to come back to you in about five minutes with an idea. And it's like, okay, great. So you need people. You need to hire well. You need to have people on your team who can think fast, work fast, um, who are paying attention to culture, paying attention to different trends. Um, and can feed that into our meetings together and our communications channels every single day. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, so it's this combination of being very planful, but also being able to be very in the moment. And how much, how much, cause if you're a small business owner listening to us talk about this, you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but Suzanne's Uber. Right. But this is all maybe not as intense as what you're doing, but if your audience is 200 people or 2000 people, the principles of what you talk, you talking about influencing people, stories, getting across your band, they apply whether you're uh, Correct. a $2 you billion do. dollar company. Absolutely. Or a, it's just about scale, isn't it? It's just about Absolutely. doing what you These can manage. Absolutely. These things all apply. And what I would say, one of the most important things that a, a small company can do if they want to start really playing on social is hire a community manager whose entire job is to be in the feeds all day, every day, and using these types of tools to see what are people saying about your products and your brand right? And then engage with those people and start to have a conversation with them. And also to see what's happening culturally and what's happening in trends and what other brands are doing. If you hire one community manager and you hire, hire one social producer, and you'll find that most social producers these days can write a little bit of copy, can use products like Canva, which makes creating graphics very, very easy. And they can shoot on an iPhone and edit a little bit. Um, some of that, that content, some of that video Video content, most social producers can do all that stuff to a certain degree. That person in combination with a community manager, that team can get you started out really, really nicely and, and start getting you on the path to, to having really good social. But is that community manager so important because that's the person who's going to tell you Here's what people are saying about our products. Here's what people are saying about our brand. Here's kind of how people are feeling about this thing that's happening in our industry, you know, that we should probably be paying attention to. Here's what people are saying about our competition, right? Here's what people are saying um, just on social in general, on different things that are happening in the world. That is such an informed entity for your products mm. and your brand. I think it's just an essential person to have. Yeah. No, that's awesome advice. Suzanne, you've been an absolute star. Thank oh, you so thank much you. for coming Oh, thank you. That on. was fun. Really enjoyable. Loads of good advice there. Loads of good tips. Um, thank you. 
uh, I think the, the video piece and that scrappy bit will give hope to <laughs> many small businesses knowing yes. actually it's just about being us and doing the best with what we can. Yes. You know, we don't need to be Hollywood. So thank you so, so much. No, um, thank you for taking the if, time to, to spend with me. If you've enjoyed this, you want to pick Suzanne's brains or find out more about what she's up to, you can find her on LinkedIn and wherever you're listening or watching to this her link to her profile will be there and you can go ask her questions and see what she's posting about and see what they're sharing at Uber. Suzanne, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate thank you. it.